Part 2. History and the Politics of Force. Chapter 5. The Use of Force. A Look at History and Historical Christian Morality. The aversion to force felt by late 20th century American Christians is peculiar from the perspective of history. We wrinkle our brows whenever we read the diaries or the deeds of our countrymen of the past. If we have both read from the same Bible, how can there be such a vast distinction in attitude regarding the use of force? Why do we screw up our faces with wonder when we read Thomas Jefferson's letter from Paris, November 13th, 1787? What country before ever existed a century and a half without a rebellion? And what country can preserve its liberties if the rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. The remedy is to set them right as to the facts, pardon and pacify them. What signify a few lives lost in a century or two? The tree of liberty must be refreshed, from time to time, with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. Try to imagine that kind of talk from a public figure today. We expect such rhetoric only from the likes of isolationist survival groups like the Branch Davidians. And we expect such actual use of arms only from federal tyrants operating through agencies like the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Ah, but once upon a time, even pastors spoke as Jefferson did. Reverend Thomas Mayhew is famous for his regular preachments about the propriety of war prior to the Revolution. And, for example, here follows an excerpt from a sermon from Jeremiah 48.10, delivered by Samuel Davies on the 8th of May, 1787. In the midst of the French and Indian War, Pastor Davies sought to inspire men to do their Christian duty and join the Virginia militia. Is the work of peace, then, our only business? No, in such a time even the God of peace proclaims by his providence to arms. Then the sword is, as it were, consecrated to God, and the art of war becomes part of our religion. Blessed is the defender of his country and the destroyer of its enemies. But on the other hand... Cursed is he that doth the word of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed is he that keepeth back his sword from blood. This denunciation, like the artillery from heaven, is leveled against the mean sneaking coward, who, when God, in the course of his providence, calls him to arms, refuses to obey, and consults only his own ease and safety more than his duty to God and his country. Were folks like these deluded? Have we seen the light they could not see and concluded that nonviolence is the, quote, more excellent way? We suspect instead that the aversion to force has something to do with growing accustomed, even spoiled, by the peace which our land has enjoyed. An anti-war mindset has been embedded into our national consciousness. We want, quote-unquote, peace, and we want the violent criminals left in jail. We say, leave the doctors alone to practice professional child slaughter peacefully. With such a mindset, what ought the Samaritan to have done had he come upon the victim in the midst of the beating? Luke 10 30 through 36. Or if you will, what would Jesus have done? In order to avoid doing harm to his quote unquote neighbors, the muggers, would Jesus have hidden himself behind a rock and waited until the beating and robbing of the neighbor victim was complete before loving him too? Or would Jesus have wielded a sword in defense of the victim, neighbor, against the aggressor, neighbor? The questions illustrate the fundamental issue of forcefully defending the innocent at the expense of the guilty assailant. More difficult 
is the ethical question of self-defense at the expense of another, even the aggressor. While the duty to use force to protect others is a sound principle with long and wide historical support, the right of self-defense is not certain. The Christian just war theory, justum bellum, was built not upon a principle of self-defense, but upon that of defense of another. Accordingly, force may be lawfully wielded by the Christian citizen authorized by the state, or by the private citizen authorized, as it were, by God, and in fact most states of the United States, for the purpose of protecting a neighbor from harm. Both Augustine and Ambrose, in formulating a just war theory, predicated the doctrine upon, quote, a responsibility for public protection, with an utter denial that under any circumstances he ever has the right of private self-defense. The duty to prefer another's life for one's own is expressed in Ambrose's comments on a passage from Cicero regarding the case of a shipwrecked man, an incompetent fellow water-treader, and a plank of wood in the water. Ought the moral man to take the plank away from the ignorant fellow and thus save himself? Yes, such questions were raised even before situations ethics guru Joseph Fletcher came on the 20th century scene. Ambrose answers the question. Although it seems better for the common good that a wise man, rather than a fool, should escape from shipwreck, yet I do not think that a Christian, a just and wise man, ought to save his own life by the death of another. Just as when he meets with an armed robber, he cannot return his blows, lest, in defending his life, he should stain his love toward his neighbor. Paul Ramsey reckons these giants among the church fathers to be, quote, too extreme in excluding private self-defense, as in every case unjustified for the Christian. He counts Martin Luther among those divines who would demur, but hastens to note that he supported self-defense cautiously. Surrounding the exercise of any right of personal self-defense with extreme caution, Ramsey summarizes historical theology of self-defense thusly. Christian ethics from Ambrose to Tolstoy has always quite correctly looked upon self-defensiveness and any other form of selfish preferential love with profound suspicion. It is useful in examining the historic doctrine of the ethical use of force to consider an extreme contrast between early Christians' thought on self-defense and modern pacifism. The non-Christian influence upon modern pacifism is evident. Ramsey, again. Early Christian thought was concerned to deny any analogy between private and public defense in order to say that a Christian who might participate in armed and bloody conflict for the sake of public protection would of course not resist even by mild or passive means any neighbor who might assault him when his own goods and life alone were threatened. In direct contrast, much modern pacifism also attempts to break down all analogy between private and public defense, but for the purpose of establishing almost the reverse conclusion, namely that, of course, individuals ought to resist by going to law if someone wishes to take away their coat. Nevertheless, it is clear that modern pacifists, in withdrawing completely from resistance on behalf of national defense, frequently make greater accommodation to the supposedly natural necessity of self-defense than ever occurred to the great thinkers who first forged a Christian theory of justum bellum. Contemporary Influences We must be aware of the non-Christian influences which have produced modern pacifism in order to formulate a biblical attitude toward the use of force, whether in self-defense, the private defense of another, government-sponsored warfare, or revolution. Modern pacifism and its cousin, nonviolence, in contrast to the pacifism of the early Christians, is inspired more by a revulsion at the sight of violence than by revulsion over the sin which is its cause, and it places an unbiblical value upon life. Witness the flowering 
quality of life ethic in contrast to the true life given by God in Christ. Life in the Christian value system has to do with harmony with God. Christians give up this physical life to gain that life which never ends. Consider the martyrs and the value they placed on this life with a capital L above the life of their bodies. And even though human bodies have a value as God's creation and the habitat of the soul, the value is not infinite. The body is not inviolable. Guilty persons may be executed. For example, capital offenders may be violently stoned to death. Wicked nations may be violently exterminated. A righteous God destroys the world with a flood and incurs no charge of wrongdoing. He is the author of our value system. The alternate value system presently intruding itself is a skewed one which admits Kevorkianisms, so-called assisted suicide. What is suicide but self-murder? And prohibits capital punishment at the same time. Accordingly, life must remain under the control of the individual, and the value of a life is to be determined by the individual, apart from any value or purpose God has for a life. Man is autonomous, free even to kill himself. Though not another, abortion, of course, is problematic, hence the denial of the humanity of the fetus. Violence is to be shunned because it threatens another's autonomy and jeopardizes the tranquility of the neighborhood. Consider contemporary movie ratings and the popular opposition to violence on TV. It doesn't matter whether or not the violence issues in the death of the wicked or not, there is more revulsion against the bloody death of anyone than there is against sexual immorality or blasphemy. Do not the sins of idolatry, blasphemy, adultery, and homosexual actions arouse divine wrath and attract righteous violence from him? How, then, can we be more offended by violence than by the sin that provokes it? We are seduced by clichés like violence begets violence, when actually violence also stops violence. Did David's violence stop the violence of Goliath? Did Phineas' violence assuage the wrath of God and save the nation? Numbers 25, 7-11. And no one likes to recall that the God of heaven is known as a, quote, man of war, who wages war against his enemies. He is the one who invented violence. He will judge sin and sinners with eternal destruction. Our God is a consuming fire, says the writer of Hebrews. He has no fundamental aversion to the stuff. Ramsey says, Violence and bloodshed are no doubt horrifying, especially in destructive total war. But the word unlovely has in Christian ethics a mainly spiritual and not a mainly physical meaning. A selfish act is the most unlovely thing, and an unselfish motive may lead the Christian to perform necessary responsibilities which prove not to be so nice in terms of physical contamination. For the Christian outlook, sin came into the world, death followed. Sin, or the contrary of love, is the greatest evil from which men need to be delivered. Death is only the last enemy of mankind, which shall be destroyed, and the sting the worst evil. Such a view has more in common with dualistic pacifism in the ancient world or with otherworldly Indian religious ethics than with early Christian pacifism. End of quote. Yes, modern pacifism is a far cry from any pacifism which might be extracted from the scriptures. It depreciates the gravity of sin. It substitutes violence for sin as an object of revulsion. The scriptures pass no judgment upon violence ipso facto. Rather, they reckon violence as force, which may be wielded for good or for evil, in which latter instance the term violence might be technically applied in contrast to force. Force, then, is a moral. We regularly speak of military or police force, by which no immorality in the use of force is intended. Thus, depending upon the way the word is used, Bernard Geetz, 
who shot his assailant on a New York subway, is vindicated, and the L.A. Police Department, who broke bones to remove, uh, remove rescuers from around an abortion facility, is impugned. Reinhold Niebuhr points out a second theological flaw of modern pacifism. Most modern forms of Christian pacifism are heretical. Presumably inspired by the Christian gospel, they have really absorbed the Renaissance faith in the goodness of man, have rejected the Christian doctrine of original sin as an outmoded bit of pessimism. Accordingly, man is believed to be essentially good and may be entreated to show his innate kind-heartedness towards the one who prostrates himself in passive self-exposure. On these two dead branches hang modern pacifist proclivities. Number one, a false view of the nature of man. And number two, a false view of violence as a source rather than a consequence of or a prevention against sin. We ought to take caution both against adopting pacifism as Christian doctrine and against the doctrine of self-defense, which assumes the right to protect oneself in all situations. Historically, the Christian just war doctrine was developed not upon the assumption of self-defense, but upon the assumption that it is right and good to protect an innocent person. Clutching rigidly to a doctrine of self-defense leaves one vulnerable to selfish self-preservation. There may well be times when it is good and right to sacrifice oneself to an aggressor for the glory of God. Military Force and the Early Church What can be said, then, about the idea of Christian pacifism? Certainly such an animal has existed in history, namely that pacifist doctrine which honors the man who will not take the life of an ass assailant in war or peace to defend himself. However, that form of pacifism which refuses to war in private in defense of another is a beast seldom found in the long stretch of church history. What can be found, scattered throughout the history of the church, is a pacifism which prohibits participation in war between governments. However, this doctrine has never been subscribed to by the preponderance of church leaders and theologians. It has been argued that the early church was pacifist and that this pristine, non-politicized church held to a more perfect view of Christian involvement in war and the use of force. By contrast, allegedly, in the fourth century with Constantine and the rise of Christianity in power, Christians were seduced by the ways of the world and began to indulge in war warfare. The idea that the early church was primarily pacifist is one that has gained currency among evangelicals in recent decades. This perception is illustrated in an article featured in the premier evangelical periodical, Christianity Today, in 1980. Robert Culver, taking a, quote, neutral look at the positions and arguments for non-resistance in various periods of church history, unquote, exemplifies this view of the early church's attitude toward war. Culver says, Yale church historian Roland Bainton writes, From the end of the New Testament period to the decade 170 through 180, there is no evidence whatever of Christians in the army. Guy Franklin Hirschberger adds, It is quite clear that prior to about A.D. 174, it is impossible to speak of Christian soldiers. About the, this time, the famous heretic, Celsus, reproached Christians for failing to help defend the empire, charging, If all men were to do the same as you, there would be nothing to prevent the king from being left in utter solitude and desertion, and the forces of the empire would fall into the hands of the wildest and most lawless barbarians. Culver misrepresents the facts as presented by erudite, albeit pacifist, scholar Roland Bainton. Immediately following the words quoted in the text above, Bainton says, The subject of military service was not at that time controverted. The reason may have been either that participation was assumed or that abstention was taken for granted. My emphasis. Moreover, When Culver quotes the ancient pagan antagonist, Celsus, 
a quote which appears also in Bainton, just a few lines above, uh, after the above excerpt. He fails to include the immediately following comments of Bainton. Such words are so explicit as to warrant the assumption that Celsus knew of no Christians who would accept military service. But he was mistaken. In the very decade in which he wrote, we have our first testimony of Christians in the army. In the so-called Thundering Legion under Marcus Aurelius in the year A.D. 173. From that day forward, the evidence of Christians in the ranks increases. What, then, is to be made of the fact that there is no discussion of military service prior to the late second century? What is to be assumed military service or abstention therefrom? Quote, it is difficult to assume that pacifism became a prevailing doctrine, given the militarism sustained by the scriptures. It is just not the likes of militaristic Joshua, Gideon, Samson, Deborah, David, and the prophets, but also the affirmation of military life in the New Testament record. See Theophilus, the centurion, and Cornelius, also see Luke 3, 14 through 15, which militate against the assumption. Examples of affirmations of the legitimacy of war come from Basil the Great in a doctrinal letter. Homicide in war is not reckoned by our father as homicide. I presume from their wish to make concession to men fighting on behalf of chastity and true religion. Perhaps, however, it is well to counsel those whose hands are not clean, only abstain from communion for three years. And from St. Athanasius. In war, it is lawful and praiseworthy to destroy the enemy. Accordingly, not only are they who have distinguished themselves there in the field held worthy of great honors, but monuments are put up proclaiming their achievements. Nevertheless, there are a number of statements against participation in war from several leading lights of Christianity from A.D. 180 until Constantine. Origen, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, and Lactantius are included among them. The fact is that there was a diversity of Christian conviction on the subject, and this diversity had something to do with situations. Bainton observes, Pacifism best flourished within the interior of the Pax Romana, and was less prevalent in the frontier provinces menaced by barbarians. The section most disinclined to military service appears to have been the Hellenistic East. The Christians in northern Africa were divided. The Roman church in the late 2nd and 3rd centuries did not forbid epitaphs recording military profession. The eastern frontier reveals the most extensive Christian participation in warfare, though concurrently we find there a protest against it, among groups tending to ascetic and monastic ideals. Well might it be surmised that those whose families were not threatened by barbarians were more easily seduced by the allure of pacifism. How lovely it would be if no ravaging savages or abortionists were loosed upon the countryside. The summary judgment on the question of whether there was consensual pacifism in the early church must be answered in the negative. There were pacifists and non-pacifists. In reply to the purported absence of Christians in the military until the late second century, the usual replies are noteworthy. Namely, number one, military service was objectionable because of Rome's oppression of Christianity. Number two, any true pacifism was a product of heresy. Example, Montanist and Gnostic influences. Number three, eschatological expectations. The Lord was due to return imminently, no need to fight. Number four, idolatry demanded of military soldiers by the cult of the deified emperor. Each point holds some merit. However, rather than explicate all the above, we would highlight yet another. Pacifism is predicated upon the idea of incompatibility between love and killing. The trauma of the act of killing was ameliorated by the Christian doctrine of the soul outlasting the body. 
Nevertheless, the early church showed an aversion to bloodshed. This was due in part to a textual error in Acts 15. Bainton declares, The Eastern text enacted abstention from, quote, things sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. In this context, blood was taken to mean the eating of blood. The Western text, as known to a long series of Latin authors, from Tertullian to Augustine, read, to abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from fornication, and from blood, plus the golden rule. In that context, blood was taken to mean bloodshed. By leaving out the fourth prohibition, quote, and from things strangled, and adding the negative golden rule, the end of the decree says to abstain from blood. Do not unto others what you would not have others do unto you. Thus, that which was intended to be a restriction upon ritual behavior became a moral prohibition against shedding blood. In reference to the Western text, Metzger says, This reading can scarcely be original, for it implies that a special warning had to be given to, Gen to Gentile converts against such sins as murder and that this was expressed in the form of asking them to abstain from it, which is slightly absurd. It, is therefore, it therefore appears to be more likely that an original ritual prohibition was altered into a moral law by dropping the reference to pnictu, things strangled, and by adding the negative golden rule, than to suppose that the original moral law was transformed into a food law. The impact of this textual variant, which is an error assuming the superiority of the Eastern and most other textual witnesses, was no small thing. Bainton again. The form containing bloodshed was early and widely received. It was applied alike to murder, capital punishment, and killing in war. On the basis of this verse, Tertullian formulated the three irremissible sins as idolatry, adultery, and homicide. Augustine testified that many regarded these three as crimina mortifera. The strength of pacifism in the early church is explained by the several factors above, not the least of which is an erroneous text whether it was oppression of Christians by the Roman government, including the prohibition of Christian soldiers, or the idolatry practiced in the army, or Gnostic heresy, which shunned the affairs of the physical world, or an expectation of the imminent eschatological conclusion of the world, pacifism figured prominently in the early centuries of the church. However, it never reached the stature of church dogma. On the contrary, it soon fell into disrepute as the church progressed from its subcultural birthplace into a position of dominion in the earth. The error of pacifism may recur from time to time, even though the just war doctrine has been maintained from Augustine to Aquinas to Calvin to the Federal Council of Churches of Christ. The biblically and historically prevailing doctrine of the just war is predicated upon the principle of the defense of the innocent. If full-fledged war is justified for the purpose of conquering an enemy of one's countrymen, the argument for the forceful defense of one's family or neighbor is prior. It is arguable, a fortiori, for the greater legitimacy of defending one's family and neighbors over the duty of defending one's country. The point is illustrated in the writings of Lactantius, who on the one hand can't go as far as to approve of war. He says, God, in prohibiting killing, discountenances not only brigandage, which is contrary to human laws, but also that which men regard as legal. Participation in warfare, therefore, will not be legitimate to a just man. However, on the other hand, Lactantius tolerates the private forceful defense of an innocent person. I ask, therefore, of those 
who do not think it the part of a wise man to be prevailed upon, and to pity, if a man were seized by some beast, and were to implore the aid of an armed man, whether they think that he ought to be succoured or not? Yes, truly, they will say that it is the part of the human being, and of the brave man too, to preserve one who was on the point of perishing. For some people, the principle of defense of the innocent will not bear the justification of actual war. They will remain confirmed pacifist to the bloody end. But a good number of people today who support the idea of just war, and might even throw in with one if caught in this right jingoist mood, fail to affirm, as regards preborn, the prior principle upon which the well-established just war theory hangs. At the least, it is a logical inconsistency. To discover the root is to speculate concerning the depravity of the human soul. How does one, number one, hold a principle of self-defense and the defense of others? Number two, affirm the extreme of a war as an extension of that principle. Number three, affirm that the preborn are innocent people deserving protection. And then number four, deny that these people ought to be afforded even basic, forceful defense. There is a gross inconsistency in the proclamations of non-pacifists who affirm the humanity of the preborn child, but deny him the defense afforded any other person. It is true that we do not have examples in history of wars waged to stop abortion. Neither do we have examples in history of abortion, quote, clinics operating publicly out of the yellow pages and with the blessing of government. Truly, the enemy has deeply infiltrated the land, even to the soul of society. How shall he be stopped? We offer no immediate solution to the larger cultural sickness, but we cannot withdraw from the truth. Force is justifiable in defense of the innocent preborn child, threatened imminently with death.